And it doesn't matter if you've obtained great things and if you're a beautiful person and have a great voice and you have all of these talents and stuff, God is unimpressed with your flesh. And if you think, but you don't know what I've done, well, then you have to compare yourself with other people to look good. And the scripture says that they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And this is where the vast majority of people live. You know, if you go up to the average person and start asking them, uh, who are you? They'll, they'll describe something they'll do. They'll tell you their job. They'll tell you all of these things. I remember when I first got turned on to the Lord, it was back during the charismatic uh, move days, 1968. And when I got back from Vietnam in 71, it was, I remember going over to a lot of these places in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And I mean, you'd go up to people and they'd say, hi, who are you? And they'd say, well, I'm a spirit filled tongue talker and I do this. And they would just in a few seconds, give you their entire resume and tell you all the things they've done. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen this happen. And it got to where people were, were bragging about what they have done. And I remember going over to Souls Harbor. I don't know how many of you ever heard of that, but anyway, I, I'm not going to call the name, but there are people that were very well known. And I went over there and I walked up and this guy says, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he just gave me all these things, told me about all the people, how many people he had seen saved and everything else. And he says, who are you? And I said, my name's Andy. And that's it. And he was waiting for me to give a list of all of the things that I'd done. And I didn't give him anything. And this guy just was convinced I needed to be born again. He came and sat down next to me and spent the whole service. Every time they'd say something, looking at me. And then during the invitation, don't you want to go down and give your life to the Lord? And, and you know what? He, because I wasn't sitting here bragging about everything I'd done, he just thought, well, you, you just really haven't encountered the Lord. And it was a breakthrough for me because I really came to a place to where, Father, it doesn't matter what people think about me. It's what you think about me. And I quit trying to promote myself. And this is one of the reasons I started my own minister's conference because, man, I got tired of going to the minister's conference and they'd seat you according to your importance. And I was always at the back. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, so anyway... You know, we just glory in our flesh. We love the things that we've accomplished. And I know that a lot of the things that I've said has challenged this and many of you who your identity is in yourself and in your accomplishments and in what the, and the things that you've done, this is like pulling the rug out from under you. And it's like, it, it's a challenge to your identity. But what I want to share with you today is that you have a new identity in Christ. And the key to the Christian life isn't you getting better. It's you changing your identity. The Christian life isn't a changed life. It's an exchanged life. You change. You move away from yourself and your own trust in yourself. And you just let God live through you. Those are, those are powerful statements, but again, that goes right over the head of most people. But you are a completely brand new person. Over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, I got a limited time today, and I'm certainly not going to cover everything I want to say, so I'll just probably quote most of this stuff. You can have them put it up on the screens or get the DVD or the CD of the service, and, and you can go back and study it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17... It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the next verse, all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto God by himself. It says that if you are in Christ, old things have passed away. All things have become new. It doesn't say all things are becoming new. It doesn't say that all things are in process, but it's a process. It says that if you are in Christ, old things have passed away. All things are brand new. One of the translations says you are a brand new species of being that never existed before. And you know, most people struggle with this because again, our identity is in our flesh and in, in our physical accomplishments. 
And so people go look in the mirror and they think this is new. And they see zits and they see wrinkles and gray and ugly. And they think this is new. No, it's not talking about your physical body. If you were fat before you got saved, you're still going to be fat after you get saved. Your physical body does not change. Now, it's subject to change, and you can change it if you'll discipline yourself, but your physical body hasn't already changed. Matter of fact, we've got scriptures like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that says this mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. And there's many scriptures that talk about that our body has to be changed. It's going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Your body's not changed yet. You still have a mortal, physical body. Your body's not changed. And your soul isn't changed. Your soul is what most people consider to be the real them. That's your mental, emotional part. It's your... Um, feelings and all of this. That part of you hasn't changed. Did you know when you got born again, you don't have a perfectly renewed mind. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that now we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, talking about your glorified body, then you will know all things, even as also you're known. You are not changed in your mental, emotional part. Did you know when you got born again, your mind wasn't just immediately perfect. You didn't have a perfect way of thinking. You have to renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and many other scriptures. Your mind isn't instantly changed. You still have your memories. You don't have my memories. You still remember things. You still have baggage. You know, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he was alive from the dead, but he was still wrapped in his grave clothes. And the Lord said, loose him and let him go. He was alive, but he had to be loosed. When you get born again, your spirit man is changed, but your soul and your body are still wrapped and you still have the thoughts and the feelings and a lot of things. Some people experience just huge transformation at salvation, and that's because they were demon-possessed. And they got delivered of their demons, and boom, like that. But a lot of other people, it's not demons, it's just carnality, and it's unrenewed mind. And that takes more effort to get your mind renewed than it does to cast the devil out. So some people, it's a gradual change. But your body and your soul are not instantly changed at salvation. If you were stupid before you got saved, you're still gonna be stupid after you get saved. Was that plain enough, Jeremy? <laughs> you know what? Your mind isn't instantly changed. Your emotions aren't instantly changed. But 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Not going to be, they are. The only way to understand that is that your spirit is the part of you that got born again. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, he's praying a prayer and he says, I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the day of the Lord Jesus. So that right there shows you that your three parts, functionally, most people only acknowledge the physical body and the soulish realm. And most people, this is really as deep as they go in their identity. They don't know themselves apart from whether they're male or female, whether you're tall or short, whether you're athletic or a couch potato. You know your physical body. You know, if I was to ask you right now, are you hot or cold? You wouldn't have to say, well, let me pray about it and uh, I'll come back and tell you tomorrow. You just are in touch with your body. You instantly know if you're hot or cold, if you're tired, if you've got pain. You just constantly are in touch with your body. And if I was to ask you, are you encouraged or discouraged? Are you uh, sad or depressed or whatever? You know, you don't have to say, well, let me pray about it and I'll come back and tell you. You know you are in touch with your soul and your body, but your spirit you cannot know your spirit through any physical, natural way. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3. He says, that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh. That's just a way of saying that spirit is spirit, flesh is flesh. You cannot contact the spirit through just your feelings. 
through your emotions. The Bible talks about that you have the same power in you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And most people immediately search their emotions and search their feelings. And well, I don't feel like that. And so they doubt. They immediately deal with doubt because they don't feel anything. You pray for somebody and say, you're healed in the name of Jesus. And they say, well, I didn't feel anything. And if they don't feel it, if there isn't some physical sensation, the average Christian cannot believe that anything has happened beyond what they can see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. That's what the Bible calls carnal. Carnal to most Christians is a terrible thing. It's like sinful. You're an evil person if you're carnal. But the word carnal just literally means of the five senses is what it's talking about. If you are limited to only what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you think that that's all that there is to reality, then you're carnal. And if the Bible says you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and you go look in the mirror and says, man, it doesn't look like I'm any different. You feel your, search your emotions, and I don't feel any different. You hadn't had an epiphany. Nothing, you haven't seen anything. There wasn't an audible voice. And you say, well, I just don't understand. The Bible is so hard to understand. That's because you're trying to discern it in carnal ways. You're trying to see or feel it. But Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is like a window into the spirit realm. You know, right now we're inside. You can't tell what's happening outside. But you know what? You could look through those doors. You could look out a window and you could see if it's raining or if it's clear or if the sun's shining or whatever. Well, in a sense, we are trapped into this physical world. All of us were raised to be carnal and to believe that anything that you can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel is foolish. You're crazy. You need to go by, you know, you need to use your brain. You need to think. And we have been trapped into this carnal realm. But the Word of God is a spiritual window. It shows us what we're like in the Spirit. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so if you want to know what you're like in the Spirit, you can't go by how you feel. You can't go by just a tingling or something else. You have to go by what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says that when you are in Christ, you are a brand new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You are completely different. You aren't a little bit different. It's like when you get to heaven, then you're going to be really changed. No, your spirit is as changed right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. One third of your salvation is over. It's complete you are as perfect in your spirit as Jesus is. You don't need anything else in your spirit. The rest of the Christian life isn't, oh God, please heal me. Oh God, please uh, prosper me. Oh God, please give me joy and peace. You've already got all of that stuff. The rest of the Christian life is renewing your mind to what you already have and learning how to just live out of your spirit. You have to change your identity. And I know that there's people that listen to me and they say, well, I'd be a hypocrite if I said that I'm healed when the truth is my body hurts. I've got a doctor's report to prove that I'm sick and I'm just trying to be real. What you're being is just real carnal. <laughs> you're just going by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And you think that that's all that there is to reality. I'm telling you, there is a world out there in here and out there the spiritual world. The spiritual world created the physical world. The spiritual world is the parent force. The parent is greater than the offspring. The spirit realm existed before there was a physical realm. The spirit world will exist after this physical world has been dissolved. The spiritual realities are real. Who you are in Christ is more real than who you are in your physical body. And yet the average person doesn't think that way. The average person, you'll pray for them and say, you're healed in the name of Jesus. All right, I'll go see. I'll go get a check. I'll go get a test and see if I'm healed. Man, my spirit of slap just wants to come all over me. Like, what's wrong with you? Amen. What part of by his stripes you were healed do you not understand? And they say, but I still feel pain. 
I'm not denying that the physical world exists, but I am denying that that's all that exists. There is a spiritual world and there is a spiritual me. And if I can believe and change my identity to who I am in Christ, then that is the greater truth. That's the greater reality. And it will always, always, always overcome the physical realm. You know, faith has gotten a bad name because many people who are faith people will sit there and, you know, they've got this huge tumor on their neck or something. And somebody says, man, what is that? And say, what? what? I don't see anything. I don't have anything. And they are denying that you have a problem. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't deny that problems exist and that challenges exist, but I do deny that the physical world is the final thing, that it is the ultimate, that this is all that there is. There is a spiritual world that I can't see or feel. And the word of God tells me what's happening in my spirit, man, and what God has already done. And when I stand on the word of God and believe that it will always trump and overcome this physical world. But you've got to see who you are in Christ. And see, this is what my whole ministry is about. This is what Jeremy, this is what we've been talking about is you trying to humble yourself and cast your care over on the Lord instead of you getting it by yourself, instead of you trying to do it through your own resources. You might be more talented than I am. You might be a better person than I am. You may have lived a holier life than I am, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? All of us have sinned, come short of the glory of God. You need a savior. And even if you're born again, you might be more talented than I am, but I guarantee you, your talents and ability are nothing compared to who you are in Christ. And if you would start not having no confidence in the flesh, but instead having confidence, I can do all things through Christ. Christians want to take the through Christ out of there. I can do all things. That's not true. You are a failure. And again, this is offensive to people. Oh, how dare you say that about me? If you bristle when I say something like that, that's because you have confidence in the flesh and you are really thinking that you are somebody special. I guarantee you all of us in our flesh are the reason that Jesus had to come and die. You in your flesh are not great. And somehow, well, you, I, they're offended. And what you do, you start comparing yourself. Well, you don't know. I've succeeded better than my siblings. I did that. Well, you're having to compare yourself with people. But when you compare yourself with God, you're nothing. Amen. Again, this was one of the great things that happened in my life. I wouldn't have understood this, but in hindsight, man, God showed up. March the 23rd, 1968, revealed his glory to me and compared to his glory Man, I was a zero with the rim knocked off. I was nothing. And that's a great place to start. That's a great place to start, to come to the end of yourself and, and get to where you just, God, I have to have you. I can't do anything without you. You know, Moses was saying, God, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will be with you and I will go with you and I will guide you in the way that you should go. You know how Moses responded? He says, God, if you go not with me, I am not moving from this place. He was taking that for granted. The Lord, he wanted to see the glory of the Lord. And the Lord said, I'll be with you and I'll go with you. And he says, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. Man, what would our life be like if we said, I'm not doing a thing unless God tells me to do it. But the average Christian will do your own thing and then ask God to bless it. That's the reason it's so hard. That's the reason you have to beg and plead and it takes so hard. You know, if you just do what God tells you to do, you don't have to ask God to bless what he has already told you to do. But we do our own thing. And then we get into trouble. I'm telling you, you are a new person in Christ and you need to esteem who you are in Christ. You need to find out what Jesus has done in you and quit trying to accomplish what has already been done for you. For instance, I go into churches and I hear many people praying, oh God, just make me righteous. Oh God, make me righteous. And I want to say, get born again. 
because the Bible says you have been made the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter four, verse 24 says, put on the new man, which remember second Corinthians five seventeen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. When it says put on the new man, that's talking about your born again spirit. Put on the new man, which after God hath been created in righteousness and true holiness. You were created righteous. There's a difference between being, being created righteous and becoming righteous. I'll just say this. I hadn't got time to explain it, but there are two types of righteousness and you do need a self-righteousness in order to relate to people. If you just live bad, treat everybody bad, then I guarantee you, you're going to suffer. So you do need a self-righteousness in order to get along with people, to live right and to do right. But when it comes to God, your self-righteousness is like a filthy rag. You cannot approach God in the flesh. John chapter four, verse 24 says, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not should, this isn't the best way. It's the only way. You can't become before God in your flesh. You know, I've lived a holier life outwardly than most people. I'll be turning 69 soon. I have never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette, never said a word of profanity. I've never tasted coffee in my entire life. That doesn't mean that you can't drink coffee. Scripture says you can drink any deadly thing. It shall not harm you. Amen. <laughs> But I'm saying I've lived a separated life. I don't know who the Beatles are in all of these things. I really do know who the Beatles are. I wasn't in that big of a vacuum, but, but I have lived a super, super holy life. But I can't approach God in my flesh. I can't come before God talking about, oh God, I've been serving you and doing all of these things. Again, it doesn't matter if it's USDA choice flesh. It's still flesh. If you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. I can't approach God in my flesh. I have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And my spirit has been created in righteousness and true holiness. If I come before God and say, oh God, I've failed you. Oh God, I'm so miserable. Oh God, I'm so carnal. Oh God, please have mercy on me. I'm in the flesh. Amen. <laughs> Some of you, man, I, I approach him like that all of the time. You're in the flesh. You're coming before him in your flesh. If you sing the same song that David sang in Psalms chapter 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Somebody says, that's scripture. It's Old Testament scripture before he was born again. And it was okay for him to say that because he wasn't a born again man. But if you come before God and say, oh God created me a clean heart, you ought to get born again. And if you're born again, then you are denying what has happened. He's already created a clean heart in you. And you can come directly into the throne room of God without any fear so that you can find help to uh, find help in a time of trouble. Ephesians or Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. Even when you've sinned, because God is a spirit and he's looking at you in the spirit and in the spirit, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. First John chapter four, verse 17 says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. In this world, right now. You are as Jesus is. How do you think Jesus is? Do you think he's sick? Do you think he's poor? Do you think he's worried? Do you think he's taking care as Jeremy's been teaching us to cast our care over on the Lord? However Jesus is, that's the way your spirit is. You are identical to him. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word for one there is hes, H-E-I-S. It means a singular one. 
to the exclusion of another. Not one in the sense that God's like this and we're a little bit like God, but we're way down here and there's this huge gap between us. No, you are identical. You are atom for atom, molecule for molecule. If there are those kind of things in the spirit realm, you are identical to Jesus in your spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, you have the mind of Christ. You're identical. You've got the mind of Christ. And somebody says, man, I don't have the mind of Christ. I can't even find my glasses and they're on my head. I forget all of these. That's your, that's your little peanut brain up here. That's your physical mind, but in your spirit. I keep pointing to my belly because John chapter 7 says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit, which they that believed upon him would receive. So your spirit, whether that's symbolic or whatever, your spirit's here in your belly. Some of you look like you got more of the spirit than others. <laughs> but it's not true. You have the mind of Christ here. And you know, this is why speaking in tongues is so important. Most people think you speak in tongues just to give yourself a goose bump or to prove that you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, his spirit is praying. The part of you that has the mind of Christ, Colossians 3, 10, you are renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Not some things, all things. Again, if you try and figure that out in your flesh, in your mind, I can prove to you that you don't know all things with your physical mind. But in your spirit, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. And when you pray in tongues, your spirit is praying. What is it praying? The hidden wisdom of God. And 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray that you interpret. Man, we face things all of the time where God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer is. And all you got to do is start speaking in tongues. And you're praying your spirit, the part of you that has the mind of Christ, that has an unction from the Holy One and knows all things. You've been renewed in knowledge. It starts speaking the hidden wisdom of God. And then all you have to do is say, Father, what did I just say? Give me an interpretation. And God will show you supernatural things. I have done this thousands of times. There are things that honestly, there is no way in my life that it could have ever happened and I would just pray in tongues and God would speak something to me and I act on it and it works. It's happened thousands of times. I don't know how people that are just depending on their flesh and trying to figure it out through your great wisdom and through your great ability. Man, I pity you. And I don't care if you've got degrees and if you've got all of these things, man, if you are just living out of your flesh, your flesh is limited. Your flesh is going to fail. And, but man, when you come to the end of yourself and you start depending upon the Lord and recognizing that there's a new part of you and Father in my spirit, I know what to do. I just don't know it with my head. So I'm going to pray in tongues and ask for an interpretation. And God just gives you wisdom and shows you things, makes you look good. Amen. Ashley gave $3,000. And some people look at that and they only look at it carnally. But if you look at it spiritually and through the word of God, that was the key to him getting a $330,000 house paid for. I know. Yeah, thank you for those two claps. <laughs> You know, if he really understood, if there was spiritual understanding, everybody in here would be giving like that and you'd all be debt free. It's not, God's no respecter of persons. He won't only do that for Ashley. He'll do it for anybody. But you got to do it in faith. But see, most of us are just carnal. We're looking at things in the natural. We've been taught that if, if this is your goal over there and if you're here, if you take some of the money that you've got and give it away, you're moving away from your goal and not towards it. That's carnal. That's the way that the natural man thinks. But the word of God, the window into the spirit says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. 
So you've got to change from being carnal and thinking, man, I can't make it over there. I don't have enough. So what I need to do is give something away. <laughs> Amen. That's crazy to the natural man. You know, we've got a 50th anniversary coming up and they interviewed this guy, uh, Larry Yonker. They showed me this video, video and they interviewed him. And when he was managing our ministry, this is back when uh, we were really struggling financially. And we had $20,000 that we had to pay on Friday. And on Monday, he came to me and told me the situation. And I had actually forgotten this. But he told me, he says, we got to have $20,000 by Friday. And I said, so how much do we have? And he says, we got $10,000. And I said, well, what we got's not enough for my needs, so I'm going to turn it into a seed. And we sent $10,000 to a friend of mine in Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> Amen. Did you know in the natural, to the car on mine, that is the stupidest thing you could possibly do. You need, you need an additional $10,000 and you're taking the $10,000 you've got and giving it away. But guess what? On Friday, we had $20,000. We were able to pay our bill. And I know some people are like, this is crazy. You're carnal. You may not be evil. You aren't a bad person, but you're just carnal. You old carnal thing. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, the Bible, it makes it so clear. There is a spiritual world. There are things that are real. And we need to get to where we find out who we are in Christ and what God has said. You are as Jesus is. Jesus is not depressed. He is not defeated. He is not discouraged. He is not full of care. He is not worried about things. And if you are, it's because you aren't in Christ. Now you may be in Christ, be born again, but you aren't abiding in Him. You aren't living in Him. You are living out of your flesh, out of your physical body, trying to figure things out on your own. Jesus is not discouraged. He is not careful. He's not worried. He's not sick. He's not poor. Jesus is not wringing His hands, wondering how He can pull things off. If you are, it's because you are in the flesh. And I tell you, we glorify the flesh. We make, try and make it look good. We put on all these fancy clothes, spend lots of money on jewelry and clothes. Did you know clothes are a testimony to your sin? If we weren't sinners, we wouldn't even have to have clothes. And we put a lot of money into our clothes and dress up and make our sin look better. I'm not encouraging you to go without clothes. I'm just saying that, <laughs> did you know that originally God didn't create us this way? And yet we, we just dress up the flesh and do everything we can to take pride in it. You get facelifts, you get other things lifted and <laughs> stuff. And, and it's all about your flesh. People get really discouraged as they get older and they have wrinkles or gray hair or something. They do everything they can to hide it. That's really insecure. And I'm, again, I'm not telling you to look bad. Man, if your barn needs painting, paint it. Praise God. <laughs> and if it needs two coats, give it two coats. But I'm just saying, you shouldn't put the emphasis on the outer man. We ought to have the emphasis on who we are in Christ and get to where you aren't so bothered and frustrated with your flesh. Some of you, you do something wrong and you just, I can't believe I could do that. It didn't surprise the Lord <laughs> because you still have flesh. I had an employee once that had pastored a church. He was, he was a, a friend of Nikki Cruz. They ran in the same group and he was from Puerto Rico and he got born again and pastored a church and had come a long ways, but he thought his wife committed adultery on him. She didn't, but he misunderstood. And he got so mad, he drove down the road, threw his Bible out the window and said, if this is the way serving God is, I don't want it. And he renounced the Lord and tried to kill himself with an overdose and wound up in the hospital. And so I went up to see him and he had given instructions not to let me in. He knew I'd come <laughs> see him. But I got past the people and anyway, I went in and when he saw me, he just started crying. I can't believe I did this. I've pastored a church. God's done great things. I can't believe that I, I could do something like this. And I told him, I said, look, your flesh didn't get saved. 
your spirit is saved, but your flesh is still a mess. And the moment you step out of the spirit and into the flesh, you are as capable of doing anything that you ever were. It's like flying in an airplane. If you think, man, look what I'm doing, 35,000 feet, 500 miles an hour, I'm awesome. It's not you, it's the airplane. <laughs> and it's your position in that airplane. If you step outside of that airplane, see how awesome you are. <laughs> The moment you step out of Christ and back into yourself and, oh God, I can handle it from here. I got it as Jeremy's been teaching. I got it. The moment you do that, you are starting to sink. Your flesh doesn't get any better. The only reason we grow and mature and get better in the Christian life is because we get less and less dependent upon ourselves. We trust in ourselves less and we learn to relean lean upon the Lord and rely upon Him. That's the thing that makes us grow in the Lord. But your flesh isn't any better. You're as capable of anything as you were ever capable of. You get out of the spirit and into the flesh, you're a mess. It's your position in Christ. You need to come to, you are a new person in Christ Jesus. That's what makes everything work. You've got to find your place in Christ. And I'm telling you that the vast majority of Christians don't even have this revelation of who they are. They think that when they get to heaven, that's when they're going to be changed. Again, 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. Not in the world to come, in this world. In this world. That's not true in your body yet. You're going to get a glorified body. That's not true in your soul yet. You only know in part and you prophesy in part but you're going to be changed someday in the body and in the soulish realm. But in the spirit realm, you are identical to Jesus right this moment. You have his knowledge, his mind, his wisdom, his joy, his peace, his anointing. And yet the average Christian is, oh God, just give me more love. You don't need more love. You need to learn to release what God has already put on the inside of you. People come up to me and say, would you please pray that God would just give me love, that he would reveal his love to me? Well, no, I won't. <laughs> He's already done it. The Holy Spirit, it says in Romans chapter 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What I will pray is that you will recognize and get an understanding of what God has already done but if you're discouraged and depressed and you come and, man, I'm just depressed, would you please pray that God would give me peace, that God would give me joy? No, I won't, because he's already done it. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You've already, God's already given you everything that you need. And when you get depressed and you say, oh God, please take away my depression, it's actually an insult. You are denying what the Bible says about you. You're saying, but I feel depressed. What you're doing, you're in the flesh. Your spirit can't get depressed. Your spirit only has love, joy, and peace. The moment you say, I'm depressed, you've solved your problem. Somebody says, how's that? Because your spirit can't be depressed. You aren't walking in the spirit. You are in the flesh. Depression is nothing but your emotions responding to what you're thinking on. If you are depressed, it's because you're thinking on depressing things. Did you know that life is depressing? <laughs> we live in a fallen world. If you stop and think about it, we're all in the process of dying. Unless Jesus comes back, every one of us is going to die. Well, I don't want to hear that. Well, you need to hear that. <laughs> you need to recognize you are not immortal. You are mortal. Your body is failing. You are in a very, you're just in different stages. You know what? I used to be young. I was awesome. <laughs> Some of you see me now as an old man, but you know what? I, I guarantee you, I, it's just part of living. And if you only think about things in the natural realm, then it's depressing to think that someday you're going to die. But when you factor in spiritual things, Death is actually an awesome thing. Praise God that we don't live forever in a fallen world, in a corruptible body. For those of us who've been born again, 
we can be like the Apostle Paul and say, man, I am in a straight between two. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, but I'm going to stay here for your sake. You can get to where for you to live is Christ and to die is gain. Death is not a bad thing for a believer. Man, it ushers you into the presence of the Lord. You know, I've lost my sister and my mother within the last 10 years. Actually, it's been eight years or something like that. And man, there was no grief at all. I have not for one ounce grieved over any of them. I miss them. And there's times that I think about them. But you know what? I don't grieve because, man, they are in the presence of the Lord. My mother... For a solid year before she died, she says, don't you dare raise me from the dead. <laughs> and every time I'd go to see her, she says, why am I still alive? She says, I want to go to be with the Lord. And she says, would you pl pray that I'd die? And so every time I'd call her or go see her, she'd make me pray that she'd die. <laughs> I prayed with her dozens of times that she'd die and get out of here and she wanted to go. Why in the world would I be sorry that she is now with Jesus? See, if you look at things spiritually and recognize that there's more than just what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, and the Word of God is our guideline. This, you just can't pick and choose what you want to believe, but you go by what the Word says. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In the, full, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you're looking at things spiritually, there is zero reason for you to grieve over somebody who's died. Actually, what happens when you grieve over somebody who's died, you're grieving for yourself. It's you grieving that you don't have them around anymore. But if you were to look at it from their standpoint, man, if they know Jesus, they are in the presence of the Lord. There is zero reason to gripe and complain. Matter of fact, you ought to be envious. You ought to be thinking, oh man, they're having the time of their life. Amen. It changes everything when you begin to recognize who you are in Christ and spiritual things. But again, most of us live in this fleshly realm. We glorify the flesh. We put confidence in our flesh. And I'll tell you another thing that that does is it makes you susceptible to hurt and rejection when you are, when you build up your flesh and you are proud of your flesh and of what you've done, then when your flesh messes up or when somebody doesn't recognize your flesh and give you the right credit, then you get hurt. But you know what? If you were dead to your flesh, dead to yourself, and you your life was in Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain is what the Apostle Paul said. If that's the way that you were living, it would just make you, you know, um, immune to all of the criticism and the rejection. And if somebody passes you over and if you don't get the recognition, who cares? I have people, there's people I'm sure that don't like things I'm saying this morning. I get criticized all of the time. And, uh, Anyway, I've been kidnapped. I've been threatened to be killed. I've been spit upon. I've been maligned. I've had a lot of things happen to me. And you know what? The way I respond to it is I just, my flesh, myself, isn't that important. It's what Jesus thinks about me. And every time something negative happens and people reject me, I just go back to the Lord and God shows me his love and that he loves me. And that's more than enough. That's the way I cope with stuff. I had a guy come up to me one time in Kansas City and just read me the riot act and start saying things about me. And I just interrupted him and I said, who died and made you God? And he just stopped and looked at me and says, what are you saying? I said, you aren't God. I said, why do I care what you think? Well, you should care what I, and I said, I don't. I said, you're nobody. You're nothing. I don't give a rip what you think about me. I said, God Almighty loves me. And this is the way that I deal with things. God loves me. God's got a picture of me in his wallet. He's got an eight by 10 of me on his mantle in heaven. And God Almighty loves me. And compared to God, you're nothing. Well, thank you. But you know what? Just because somebody said, we love you. And, and there are lots of people that love me. I am not going to transfer 
my acceptance and my self-worth from what God says over to people because you may love me today and you might not love me tomorrow. (laughs) I might mess up and people's love is fickle. And so, you know, we have lived in obscurity for decades. And uh, I actually have gotten fairly used to being criticized and rejected. And it's, it doesn't bother me that much. But now we're in a season where people are, are recognizing me and people are giving me honor. And it's actually a little hard for me <laughs> to get used to. I was used to being rejected. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable around people that are saying nice things about me and stuff. But I can guarantee you this, I am not going to take all of the favor and all of the people that are being nice to me and say, oh, well, Lord, I don't need to fellowship with you and keep my eyes on you as much because it's fickle. It can change in a heartbeat. I could do something wrong and maybe I'd be seriously wrong and maybe I deserve rejection from people or whatever. But man, Jesus is never going to leave me nor forsake me. I'm sealed in the Holy Spirit. I'll talk about this tonight. I hadn't got time to share everything with you, but tonight I'll share with you that this doesn't fluctuate based on your performance. Who you are in Christ remains the same. And I just have to maintain my focus on Jesus and what He thinks about me through the bad times and through the good. There's a lot of people that through bad times, they'll turn to the Lord and let God build them up. But then when everything gets good... There have been more people destroyed by success than there has ever been destroyed by hardship. Because in success, people will transfer their identity away from who they are in the Lord and look at their success and look at the things that they're doing. And and the moment you do that, the moment you get in the flesh, it's impossible to please God. And you've got to just stay focused on the Lord through the good times, through the bad times, through all times. And when you find your place in the Lord, that is so much better. That is so much better. And it just makes you immune. People can reject you and it's like, well, who are you? Man, God Almighty loves me. I was praying with someone today who he had a pretty good attitude, but he said he had had a lot of abuse when he was a young kid and He wasn't even sure what it was. He's blocked all of this stuff out, but there's just a hurt on the inside of him. And I said, you know what you need is just a revelation of God's love for you. And I said, whatever it is that's bothering you, it'll be like, here's this little stick figure that's six inches tall and here comes a tsunami. And I guarantee you, it's going to wash the thing away. You don't have to go back and identify every problem that you've had and go back into your mother's womb and forgive all of this stuff and get your memories healed. Man, just get a revelation of who you are in Christ and what He's done. And.